<laughs> As always. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. I hope hope we have the rest of the people here. Uh, I mean, probably had to make an option if to get coffee or to do something else. Uh, so we have the panel, the end of this uh, webinar is a panel with uh, where we hope we have uh, great presentations and discussions from your audience. And we have uh, excellent people sitting with us on the panel. Uh, Thorun Bjarnadóttir, you can see them here at the overhead. Thorun Bjarnadóttir, who is the uh, director for the Intercultural Education Global Progress and Strategy Alliance, University of Minnesota. We have uh, Sigurður Haldarsson, the program director uh, at the Icelandic University of the Arts. Auðberg Björstóttir coming from the University of Akureyri, the director for the Central Teaching Learning over there. And Marion Dellinger, who is a PhD student uh, also up north in Hólar University and the University of Iceland. So we have a, a varied group of guests here. And uh, I think also you can take down the, uh, if you would lower the overheads. So we can see the, uh, better see the panel. And we have had quite a lot of input today. I, I feel like, you know, my, my, I look forward to just this day being over so I can kind of uh, go somewhere and think about all these issues that have been brought up here and all this knowledge that we have gathered here today. But I would like to, uh, like the participants of the panel to shortly present them so we can see them coming here from the group of audience. So Thorun, if you would be the first and give a short presentation on... Yes. Uh, Thank you very much for inviting me to this. Um, it's really um, special for me to be part of something that Europeans are doing. Uh, I think the student was very right when she says, you know, we tend to think of international nationalization just sort of in our vicinity. And even though the US is fairly large, um, it is still a US perspective and a European perspective and, and how do we ever figure out a way to put this together. So I'm very excited to be here. Um, I can talk about this for four days without stopping. Um, so I'm going to try to be brief and uh, tell you a little bit about my involvement here in the internationalization effort that we have done here at the University of Minnesota. We have been at this for about 10 years, maybe 11. and. Um, we started by thinking about the fact that we needed to create kind of a, um, a pool of uh, both staff and faculty, but we focused mostly on faculty uh, that would have the skills uh, needed to, um, you know, internationalize their course. And so then we had to figure out what do we then have to teach them. And um, so I always come into the to this experience being the intercultural trainer. And so I'm asking faculty, so it's really about their courses. It's about developing their curriculum, making um, a class that they have and turn it around into a more of an uh, internationalized curriculum. And so what do I mean by that? So let's say that you have a class on um, literature. Uh, I work with a professor in the University of Minnesota Duluth campus on that work and um, he was struggling with the fact that he really thought that internationalization was simply okay so I teach literature and then we need to make it more international so let's say in the 10th week we have a week on uh, we read some authors from other countries now that is not what we mean by it uh, a lot of people think that that's what it is but it's more like David what are the literature concepts that you are teaching you know, what is that? And how can you teach students to do that with literature from other cultures? And um, so this was like a big aha moment for him. And he just shifted the entire curriculum into that everything that he was teaching was essentially international. So the literature now was not a week of international literature. It was all literature. And the students then had to learn to diagnose um, the literature that they were reading, no matter where it was from, uh, with the lens of that literature offers. Uh, so it wasn't special, it wasn't extra, it was essentially fused in all the courses. 
um, we very much sort of emphasize that when you are over re recreating your course, um, that you infuse intercultural knowledge and into those classes. And so, for example, um, I work with a, a professor of veterinary medicine, and she really wanted people to understand that veterinary medicine is not the same around the world. And um, we were limited in a lot of ways in that class, but we, um, I came in and I did a communication session. So I showed people how, um, I showed the students how people from different cultures operate and talk differently, communicate differently in different ways. And that was a sort of a big aha for them. And then we invited uh, 17 veterinarians. So we're kind of, this is a very big university that I work for. We have 6,500 international students. And so uh, we got lucky that in the veterinary school, there was a lot of uh, international veterinarians. And so we got 17 of them to come to the class. It's a hundred person class. It was always just lectures. <clears throat> and instead, we now had broken them up into smaller groups with 17 veterinarians from around the world talking about veterinary practices. Just changed the, the class from being just straight information giving to more of a, uh, a small group conversation into this. And this was always the highlight of the class. We also want people, just the, the faculty member, to think about what are the attitudes that you want students to develop? You know, it's sort of like, what are the skills, what are the knowledge, and what, are the, what is the attitude? What do you want your students to care about when you are teaching? What of this material do you want them to care about? And so they have to kind of think that through. And so essentially, when we are doing the art, <coughs> we are doing the um, internationalization of the curriculum when we really teach people to flip their, um, their course from being a straightforward lecture delivery course into more of a, you know, we come up with ways to make it more engaging, um, make it more of, um, you know, take any opportunity to have to make it more of a conversation with people from different cultures. Um, and sort of just kind of gain different perspectives. We take every opportunity. And so it's a really fun process to be part of because um, the faculty cares so much about their material, their knowledge, and they really want to depart this knowledge on their, to their students. Um, but how to do that is often a mystery because we always teach the way we are taught and the way we like to be taught. And so we expand that into, okay, so there is information delivery. Um, what, what else, you know, so there might be some, um, some videos that you could use um, to set up conversations. You might use, um, and definitely use then examples from different parts of the world, just to kind of get that, bring that into the, into the classroom. Um, and then how do you assess this? How do you assess that these things have taken place, that people are gaining knowledge, they are gaining skills, they are gaining, um, you know, different attitudes, different perspectives. And so, you know, for example, I work with a professor who had, a, I don't remember exactly what the title of the class was, but it was political science and environmental issues. Now, these are easy ones to do globally because I mean, this is an issue for global, but in order to really make it global, she was working with a rural campus here in Minnesota and uh, not a lot of uh, international students there or not a lot of chances at the small town and not a lot of chances for, any outside perspective. So we connected her to the students at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, the city uh, campus, where we have all the international students. And so she had her students choose a country. They had to then research that country was with a specific question about environmental issues. And then they had to be prepared to interview an international student from that country about that topic. So the double checking, the you know, how they were thinking about this material. Could that bounce off an international person from that country and gain some kind of a perspective? Um, so I do think that internationalization is very much a quality improvement. Um, 
it definitely changes the course, uh, make them more, I, I'm not so sure if it's necessarily more interesting. I think they make, the, I think they definitely make the material more interesting because we're essentially teaching people how to teach in different ways to different um, audience, different learners. And so some students are more into, um, you know, just give me the information, I can process this. Uh, other students would like it to be more engaging meaning they want more group work or they want to more uh, create projects around things. So the final is not, not always a paper. It could also be a podcast. It could essentially be a movie or it could be a, um, like you name it. And students come up with amazing things. And so I do think that this is part of internationalization of the curriculum is definitely improving the teaching in, in every way. And it's almost like the internationalization is kind of like a bait you know, yes, we can make it a class international, but we also make it a lot better class for the students. So it is a bit like going back to Alspeth's uh, presentation today. It, it is all about the academics that you get them to uh, ch probably change or broaden their mindset a bit and and uh, and reflect on the on the curriculum. Yes. yes. Thank you for that. Sigurður. Uh, I'm into it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sigurður. No, I can't see Sigurður. Are you there? Yes, I'm. Yeah, I, here you I, are. Here you are. There's a lot, lot of people on the screen. I'm thinking, oh, where are my people? Where is my panel here in this situation? Uh, you are the, uh, uh, you run a European Master of Music. So yes. you probably, uh, different from Thorin, you are, uh, but you're all, you are experiencing of having students from all over Europe in your program. Yeah, so uh, thanks for, uh, it's great to be here and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so I, I represent the Iceland University of the Arts um, and we are running this uh, European Music Master for new audiences and innovative practice. We call it NIPE. Uh, the working environment has become a reality uh, where each artist is at the same time an author, performer and producer and community engagement on a personal level is no longer a mere option. It's like obvious and essential. Uh, the night, night program aims to support professional in being artistically flexible practitioners that are able to adjust to a wide range of societal contexts. And the program is targeting students with a high level performance and creative skills oh, this... new audiences diverse artistic and cross-sectoral settings uh, i'm sorry I, I might have some connection uh, the sound is a bit uh, so this master is a collaborative program okay A little bit slower collaborative and it has a multicultural nature uh, as its unique flexible structure draws in students from many nationalities and backgrounds who share their diverse skills tradition and style a rich cultural heritage contributed by both students and staff has often led to further collaboration across borders and sometimes are coming out of it. Uh, a very important element is the establishment of a safe and neutral learning environment built on trust where everyone is free to experiment and the benefits of both mistakes and successes are and it's, it's strongly based on student-centered learning uh, and uh, there is a kickoff moment, for example, for the students that are starting on the program, where they all meet in one place. And this establishes an international community that will take on this two year journey. The cultural diversity brings curiosity, excitement and creative energy into the learning environment. And the close creative and social in and conversation. It ev evokes empathy and understanding. 
uh, cultural international aspect are equally important for the staff as well as for the student the academic staff beside the students in an active participation on an equal level and the positive experience from in this uh, pro, uh, international and cross-cultural interaction has led to experiments with further collaborative courses and projects that are built on blended mobility so so i would say the night master's program has for more than a decade has had a leading role in collab. No, no, we can't hear you. And cross sectoral approaches. Okay, do you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I want just to end uh, with uh, saying that the NIAP Masters program. It has been uh, for more than a decade uh, having a leading role in collaborative and cross culture and cross-sectoral approaches in the Iceland University of the Arts. So the NIPE has had and it involves sharing of methods, practices, knowledge and cross-fertilization with other art forms and the community on a broad side. Uh, you know, uh, there is a web website that the schools are maintaining together that can be shared I can I can share that mm -hmm. on the on the comment the chat if people want to read more about it so so, the, so this is a program that is uh, within the unit similar to Brynja Brynja's and 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 uh, presentation here before when she was describing the international program at the School of Education. So it is an international program within the uh, University of the Arts. And yes, <clears throat> and and it has been a bit. Your presentation has sorry has been a bit broken. So I suggest people go and, and look at the uh, at the website and see what what you are actually doing. But but you said it has has influenced other processes or other programs as well within the. The university yeah so i think uh, i mean it has been going on for uh, more than a decade i would say 12 13 years so it has been a very good platform putting and experimenting with with these elements of course the the arts and not the least music has always been a, an international uh, kind of mm -hmm. uh, and it has been always uh, very important to bring together different cultures and this is how music has has developed through ages and, and uh, thousands of years so so in a way uh, it's a kind of a organic approach to internal international um, education i would say so the subject is, is quite uh, international in a sense, different from maybe what Thorum was explaining, how she kind of had to uh, introduce that idea into the other disciplines that uh, of the teachers that she was working with. So in a sense. Uh, yeah. So, sorry, sorry, Sigurd, yeah. Hi, Guron. Hi, Björk. Hi. Hi. <laughs> well, similar to maybe Thorun, you are working with, uh, that, and this is how we're going to develop uh, educational practices within universities. So you are uh, in the core of that as a director of the Center of Teaching and Learning at University of Akureyri. And it would be interesting. Uh, Thorun has a, Thorun's university has a very strong strategy toward internationalization and probably is different to work under uh, um, when, a, when a university has such a strong uh, mission and strategy and vision, it's probably reflects better on the practices within that university. But uh, Ölbjörg, how does it, how, what is the case in the University of Akureyri? Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I want to say that Thorin, uh, Thorin, she 
So I, I, I uh, studied at the University of Minnesota. So I uh, have used her services. We always thought she was just there for the Icelanders, but so uh, but so I know the international um, ISSS. That's what we call them, or ISIS. Uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, here at the University of Akureyri, we have, of course, a much smaller university than the U, but uh, we have, um, in terms of internal internationalization, we have we have a study program at the graduate degree, polar law, master's degree that's taught on English. And uh, we've had a lot of international students take that. And the faculty that teach are, uh, most of them are just around the world. So we have, because of our small size, we have in a sense, uh, this institutional internal internationalization has taken place in some sense because some of our faculty are uh, English speakers. Actually, a, a quite few of them are that, and they've been that for some time. So, so we have, even though we don't have a, a study line in the undergraduate that's just in English, but we have a couple of courses that are taught in English. So in that sense, uh, and I, I was just thinking when we were, when I was listening to the um, other speakers that this just happens because we're so we're in the northern part, where and uh, I mean we we have academics that come from all over the world. So. And also we have, uh, we've offered uh, online um, learning for such a long time. So we've used that. We've had the specialists come from abroad and teach online. Now it's easier. Uh, before they, they all wanted to come here because who doesn't want to come to Iceland? But now we can use the uh, online um, platform a little bit more. And we also have for, uh, for our non-native uh, students and also for our faculty, our faculty have taken these courses. We have three courses that are, uh, Icelandic for foreign language, and we and and in some of these courses we go, it's kind of like a study line in that sense. They learn about Icelandic nature and culture and history and culture, but and they're all together in these courses. So, uh, so that's a, a little bit what we do. We also have um, in uh, the center of teaching, we offer a graduate course for our faculty or teaching faculty about the university teaching. And it's constantly involving. Guðrun is part of that course and others. And now we've taken on topics such as gender equality and uh, equity. And that's, uh, and we're trying to, and, and I was thinking when Guðrun, when Thorin was talking about having this discussion with the teachers, I'm like, yeah, I have to get Thorin on board. So I'll probably <laughs> send her an email. <laughs> But because that's so, I mean, it's just because you, when you get somebody from the outside that asks those professors, what and how are you internationalizing your course? It's like, well, okay, that's a question we haven't, maybe we should ask more often. And we did, uh, um, 2015, uh, we did a course um, based on the COIL model, the collaborative online international learning, kind of uh, taken from the University of Minnesota. We've taken a lot of things from that university because of our connections with it. But, and we had, it was a, and this was actually, it was an internationalization that uh, we, at first we weren't really thinking about maybe that in that sense. So it, it's, a, it's a course in fishery science and, um, and because that's a small field and the faculty member that was teaching that course was talking to other experts at a conference somewhere. And then they realized they're all teaching the same thing or kind of, but they have their specialty with, you know, the Atlantic Ocean and all, you know, all the fishery. I don't I'm not going to go into the details there, but they decided to teach a course together. At first, they were just going to teach it together, and then they decided let's let the students from uh, we had Norway, Canada, and Iceland join that course, and we had graduate level students from Canada and undergraduate from Iceland. They could join the course. It was hosted at the from Canada, and we had a little bit different learning management system at that time, but it was taught from like the leading as experts in fishery science. And it was really interesting to have mixed the students together because these were students that did not have the chance to go abroad, but they could they could meet students abroad and they could uh, get a little sense of the international session. So, uh, and we did take, um, we did uh, take, do focus groups with our Icelandic students and what they, um, for them was we could, it was very noticeable that they were not as used to discussion as the Canadian students. So that was kind of like one of the, you know, and that didn't really just surprise us, but also those students were graduate students. But that's uh, one of the things that we can do with online learning. We can do much more of this. And uh, we have 
because of the ties of international ties with our faculty, we've, we have, you know, like I said before, we will have, we have faculty come from abroad and teach. So that's kind of what we're, we're doing. So you're actually kind of saying that the smallness and your experience with online teaching might be a very good tool for uh, continuous development of intercultural education, internationalization. Yeah, because of the smallness, the institutional barriers are not that, um, yeah, they're kind of, it's, it's an easy, it's not like a Catholic church. We can just go and talk to somebody and change things. <laughs> yeah. With all, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Björk. So you can see there are various differences between you and Thorin, but, but the same aim and goal. Mm -hmm. um, finally, uh, the final panelist here. Where are you? Yes, I'm there. <laughs> Hi, Marion. Marion Dellingen, you could you you are a, a PhD student from abroad, an international student, uh, and we were kind of erupt with the student uh, presentation was here at the very end. So we you tend to be presented at the end. You know we should be aware of that. That's one thing we should th be thinking about. Uh, uh, so could you tell us a little bit about your experience as an international student? How how uh, uh, coming to Iceland, coming to Hole or up north and, and uh, getting to know the Icelandic educational system. And we've had some examples from Brynja students, uh, from yeah. Brynja's research, and it would be interesting to see what your experience is like. Yeah, actually, so I originally come from France uh, and I had, I already had some uh, international um, experience before coming to Iceland because I spent three two to three months, let's say, uh, in the US also, uh, five years ago already. But um, actually, I really agree, let's say, with what uh, Elspeth and Brynja were talking about today, because um, it's true that the language is, of course, the first barrier uh, when you go abroad, of, of course. But once this barrier is no longer there, like for example, if you have classes that are taught in English, I think the real point is really like the, the cultural difference because I think for me, this was like really the main challenge um, because like, yeah, it's true that if you, if you are used of a way of thinking things like uh, the way you are expected to think in your country, but then you arrive in a country where like the social organization and everything is totally different. You like you arrive in a, some kind of a new planet somehow, and uh, it can be really hard to adapt to this. But at the same time, it's also a great chance. What has also been um, mentioned because then it fosters your flexibility, your adaptability. Um, like, because you have no choice. <laughs> and uh, that's also why I think uh, physical mobility is also very important be because you don't get to know all those differences if you stay at home at, um, in a way. Um, and also, as I said, I also very agree with uh, Binya's um, speech because she mentioned a lot of uh, stories that I actually experienced myself and that I would call, maybe the word is a bit harsh, but that I will call xenophobia in a sense. I'm not talking about racism, but really xenophobia in its um, how, like um, etymological uh, meaning, like really like fear of the stranger, mm -hmm. uh, because um, there is this whole thing that Icelanders are really afraid that their language would disappear. So, so like t like doing things in English is a bit scary and there is always like a pressure on you to learn Icelandic and stuff. And um, like, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, that's, uh, that's my uh, view of this. But um, I'm also very open to this. There is no problem for me with, with that, but there is something that you can feel in the air around you that uh, that uh, you're not always uh, welcome. And I also experienced this with the other departments here in the university because it's really hard to get in touch with the other departments. Like for example, the, the we have three departments in this university, the, the fish department where I am, 
the horse department and the tourism department and all the the three the three departments are very very international like for example if you look at my department there is basically no icelandic student actually here i mean in the research Same. department yeah yeah, yeah. That is interesting. I'm talking, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> actually i'm just talking for the for the research part because mm -hmm. there are also like yeah. aquaculture that are taught in uh, in Icelandic and stuff, but really for the research part, there is no Icelandic uh, students. We are all um, uh, international students from a bit of everywhere. Um, but still, even if the, the three department departments have a lot, uh, a high percentage of international students, it's really hard to uh, get in touch with each other because I also experienced that like when you come and say hi, like you, you're kind of ignored somehow. <laughs> but uh, yeah, still, or at least the final word that I could give about that, about our, my department is that at least for the fish department, we know that internationalization is, uh, is vital because as I said, if, uh, if internationalization would not happen in our department, it, I think it wouldn't exist basically yeah. because <laughs> and also if when you are such a small university as Holar University is, you are kind of forced to see in a broad way, like forced to go and look for knowledge from outside because you are too small to have all the knowledge that you need. And also all the material that you need to do good research and stuff. So you you have to build uh, collaborations outside uh, of your own place. So that's why, for example, we are uh, four uh, PhD students in this department, and we all have um, PhD committees that are very very broad. Like for example, mine, I have one person from the US and one person from um from australia as well and we are collaborating with a, a lot of french uh collaborators so i really feel like at least in my department the internationalization is primordial and uh, well done <laughs> but and, and of course you are a phd student so you possibly more related to the research part of the university yeah. uh, education uh, so probably different from uh, the students that Brynja is accepting is at the undergraduate, more at the undergraduate level, isn't it, I think? So that would, and everybody kind of supports the, uh, find, finds the internationalization of the research area less problematic and, and see the importance in that, as we have said before. So, uh, Bia and Emma level, sorry, Brynja, yeah. Uh, I opened the floor to the questions here for the audience, and now I have to read that. Um, Ausli, are you going to help me in this? Let me see. Okay. There's one question here for, to you. Let me see, I have to scroll this out a bit. Oh my, this is a long, you, you give me long questions. <laughs> yeah. Do you see, here's one from Elspeth to you. Elspeth, Elspeth to you, Marion. Do you see any difference as an inter international PhD student compared to the experience in US? So you probably were at a different educational level there. You well, see I couldn't really make the like because when I was in the US, it was not really I was not taking classes either. It was really also a research project, and I don't I don't think I I could mention a lot of differences actually. Um, yeah, just just the way of life really was different, but. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't think no. But I, oh yeah, I see the question now. Okay, it was, okay. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I I yeah I couldn't really answer this question because I was not really taking classes there. So. 
this is fine. So, uh, and there, thank you, thank you, Marina. There's another question uh, from Susan to Öybjörg. Öybjörg, can you say it? Kind of mentions that, you know, th things happen in Iceland, you know, they're not very strategically planned, but something happens and we have to teach in English because of this and that. So how can we, and is your institution building on this to make sure that our institutions do not become complacent about internationalization and instead work to a, a strategic response? Should we, how can we do that? It's just not ha just happening, but how, how could we actually uh, organize our institution in a way that they better are more proactive or maybe just reactive, you know, mm -hmm. strategically reactive to what is uh, taking place? Mm -hmm. That's, I wish I could answer just yes, but uh, <laughs> but I, I think it's a really good point. And uh, also I think with here, uh, this university, even though it's very small, it's grown uh, in no, student numbers and also in faculty. In, well, it's grown in faculty numbers, but now in student numbers, it's just exploded in a little bit. So we've been really, really busy mm -hmm. and we've had, uh, and this is something we, uh, also with the faculty, with our uh, foreign faculty, we just have to take that into account. Yeah. And um, uh, I don't know if he's here at the meeting, the one uh, with the international affairs. Uh, he's probably not, no. So uh, so I think, yeah, that's, uh, and also, uh, you know, webinars like this just get you thinking that uh, this is something, I mean, we need to do this. And also because we need, uh, I mean, and we were doing this in terms of uh, the equality, uh, within that teaching course. And it was really, um, for us, uh, we had a, a teacher come in that um, specialized in gender or gender studies, and we weren't sure where to start because mm -hmm. we weren't really, so should we start here or here or where's the knowledge and, uh, and where's the experience? So this is something we should, um, if you ask me after we've done the course one more time, I'll say, yes, we got Thorin to teach for us. Yeah, so, yeah. And Sigurður, um, would you like to add to this? Because you, you, you're, uh, you were a bit broken in before. But I was, I was, I was thinking like, uh, it, it, I mean, you have students coming from everywhere. Uh, are there any specific challenges? Because you, you, you promoted this as a very good, a good program that, and, and the, uh, and it's a good, I mean, it, the, the, uh, qualities of having such a program are, are great, but are there any uh, difficulties or challenges that you find are the most difficult to work with? Or what kind of challenges do you face? Well, well, actually, yes, I mean, of course, there are challenges and, but uh, actually, I, I, I like to think more in terms like Elspeth did, like opportunities, about yeah. opportunities, yeah. because that, that's what it's, um, what is more kind of uh, proactive yeah. to work from. But I, of course, I mean, we we have this language issue, of course, like everyone else, but um, especially when we are uh, working uh, in um, uh, like commu community engagement, for example, going into into so social uh, settings where where we need to communicate with with people on, on different uh, backgrounds and, and so on. So it's it's a, it's quite a lot of uh, challenges, and also we have su uh, such a small department that our international students they they need to get access to courses that are sometimes taught in Iceland, yeah. for example, and th things like that, of course. But I mean, otherwise, I think it's more or less uh, positive opportunity. Is that yeah. are there? That are presented. Excellent. But I also, I also thought I've been thinking about the uh, what you said, Brinja, in your presentation was the the uh, the analysis that you did on the uh, on the uh, stepna the the policies of the universities, uh, and 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 it's kind of I think that's a probably a very interesting thing to do to to look at at the uh, different strategy and policy papers from our universities and see what kind of um, ideas about interculturalization and internationalization are reflected in that and I think I mean 
talking from my uni institution, the University of Iceland, we probably don't have far from have a common understanding on on the concept. So that's a topic that we should be discussing more. I was thinking when we were doing this here, we could have a especially in COVID, you know, when we're all online, it would be nice to have a special interest group in Iceland on on this uh, on this con on this project on this uh, concept. Uh, Brynnes has released two papers on this, yeah. Um, any other questions? Guðrún, can I just make one more point? Yes, you can, Thorin. In terms of uh, teaching students intercultural skills, yeah. one, of, one of the really good places is if people are, if students are living together, um, like can imagine that in Akureyri or Holar or um, these places where people actually live together, those are ripe spots for intercultural learning because they're also ripe spots for intercultural annoyances, uh, conflict issues. And learning to solve those things with intercultural skills um, is a really good place to start. If you have that chance to do that, I would say go and use those uh, environments as a place to learn as well, yeah. not just. No, certainly Thorin went. Oh, you, did you just put on mute? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thorin. I think that's right. And uh, and I mean, we've seen activities like that in our universities. They are world uh, language ca cafes and so on. So they, that kind of support is somewhat known and provided. And but I think in real life situation, we we need to make use more use of those uh, opportunities we have there. Okay, are we open for any more questions or any more points, reflections? I was, I was interested and I'm sorry, this is a bit out of the panel, but in the last presentation, is Peggy, Peggy still with us? Peggy. Um, yes, yes, I'm here. Yeah, I, I, because uh, you, you weren't you, you weren't provided any time or space for questions because you was, we were a bit running a bit late. Um, I thought, I, I mean, many of your points are really, really interesting, and I, and I would like to open the uh, the board floor for discussions to you and, and for me it was an interesting thing about uh, that the importance of institutions seeing the importance of inst of internationalization being measured in um, their ranking and, and so on and, and we can often see that in 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 our um, everyday practices that what what we is discussed is the number of students coming in and going out as exchange students so it's a numerical uh, tick in the box bit uh, practices often. So, uh, and you were, you were kind of um, promoting that or, or, or uh, uh, you were presenting the, the um, maybe the dislike students do not like uh, as much. You want to go physically abroad, you know, or, or being able to, to, to be mobile in, a phys in the physical world. Are there any questions uh, to Peggy because we didn't give her much of a time. So I will add you to the panels. It's easy when you are online. <laughs> yes, thank you. I just wanted to say uh, maybe just to, to add on to your comments that uh, actually today we had a seminar on the recognition as well by the EUA. And this was exactly um, this can be like easily traced to the internationalization um, because like students when they are going abroad they are actually they actually want to be secure that uh, the learning that they will do there will be accepted and recognized by their own institution especially if they're not coming to study in a certain country but are going rather for a mobility and this is maybe a problem that we see because not every institution even though the bilateral agreement is standing will actually um 
uh, recognize these competencies the students learned abroad. And this is something that we need to work on because we see that all of these procedures are kind of yes. quite long and sometimes students lose uh, some points in between and sometimes the institution doesn't want to recognize. And uh, this is a really good time uh, when to kind of bring in the academic intake, uh, 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 the automatic recognition procedures. Yes, oh, good point, excellent point. We, I know and our students have had problems with that as well, even though they go on, on recognized universities and not only mobility uh, exchanges. Okay, I, I got one question from yep. uh, Katrin who said that um, there was a point of distinguishing between having internationalization as a tool to better education versus internationalization as a topic. Yeah, I think uh, internationalization can be utilized as a tool to better education because uh, we see oftentimes that uh, some of the experiences that we gather, uh, not from our own uh, institutions, but from the outside, from some other um, perspective or some other institution as well, uh, can benefit actually highly to the institution. For example, some of the uh, procedures that they have, uh, for example, on micro-credentials, on diploma supplement procedures, etc., uh, can be utilized very good by uh, different institutions. And we see this, um, let's say, this uh, traceability uh, in the tools that are being used between the universities who are cu currently uh, members of the European Universities Initiative, because here we have um, clear um, dispersion of the activities and uh, let's say the uh, recognition is mutual between these institutions. And here they are utilizing internationalization in the best possible way by improving their own structures um, as a part of these uh, alliances. And then the internationalization is not only a tool to achieve something, so to achieve higher numbers of students, better ranking, uh, better prestige for the institution, but it actually becomes the purpose uh, of the education. And what new opportunities do we see in the new blended uh, mobility options in the new Erasmus program? So I, I consider that uh, the very good th uh, thing about the blended mobility options are um, the flexibility that the student has in their own education. Um, however, when we were kind of doing the analysis and the research of this uh, internationalization at home versus the um, mobi physical mobility of the students, we saw quite negative results uh, on the side of this uh, online tool because uh, students not only reported that it's harder for them to follow, but also that they have a bigger responsibility and a higher workload this way. And they also comprehend their studies a little bit slower and um, with quite, um, let's say, not dubious, but it's always, um, there's always something that uh, is left uh, kind of unsaid or uh, ununderstood by the student. And uh, also we saw uh, that um, in this blended mobility, uh, the students see a potential of kind of having this open access uh, journals and really being able to kind of learn also from home without uh, necessarily going to the institution itself. But they were also kind of um, warning us about uh, some of the problems that are arising where these systems are not in place and then the students didn't have the access to internet or some of them didn't have the access to personal computers or the study materials and then they found it extremely limiting um, especially if, let's say the institution uh, doesn't pay a subscription to a certain journal and then the students couldn't access access it from home for example thank you my panelist any final words from the four of you? Um, yeah, uh, I hear, Thorne, I think I could say a few more things. Um, I think that the intercultural field has a lot to offer classes um, in order to get people to understand the different perspectives that are in the classroom. And so, you know, I have done, um, you know, all kinds of activities with students just to kind of bring out, wow, I would never have thought of that. And really, is that quite possible? <laughs> and then have a very rich conversation. Um, 
uh, following those kinds of aha moments. And that's what the intercultural fields offer, offers to the internationalization is to um, bring in activities that then start a conversation that would not otherwise happen without it. And so I, for example, there's one activity that I, that I use, it's called I Am From. And um, it's just a little poem that people write and it's amazing the kinds of conversations that come after that. And um, I could go on and on, but it sounds more like a, yeah, that's my life. But it's, um, it really does offer a way to bring this out, bring this to life, what we're talking about. Thank you, Thorin. I think, yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Any final words, Marion? Um, not really. Um... Yeah, I think what, um, so I don't remember who said this, I think it was Sodren also, but uh, it's really true that in small communities, uh, like we are in the north of Iceland, it's really like where you are embedded in uh, new cultures and like this is the real start point for really learning uh, a new culture, because when you are in a big capital, like usually capital are already uh, internationalized in a way very uh, globalized so let's say so yeah that was a really good point <laughs> and Sigurd yeah um well i think uh, uh yeah do you hear me yeah we do okay i'm gonna take <laughs> off the video i'm <laughs> okay uh, so yeah i think that uh, our uh, our experience is that uh, intercult intercultural approach to higher education is, is really transformative and uh, the activities that have to do with that uh, have turned out to be also it has taken most of the students like their whole two-year studies to realize the impact mm -hmm. of it which means that it, it includes a lot of um, reflection about themselves and, and everyone else and, and people really go through a, a big learning experience um, and I yeah so I think it's um, uh, definitely a great tool for um, increasing understanding and uh, inclusion in, in, in the community definitely. So it addresses the quality of the education, as Thorne says, the quality of the community, as you were saying, Marion, and the quality of the student learning, as you were saying, Sigurður. And, and Auðbjörg. Yes, uh, I just, uh, I was just uh, reading the comment from Harpa. I think, uh, I think, yeah, thank you. It's just, it's been... Uh, uh, informative to be here, and I think we should, uh, especially about here at Akureyri, we should uh, just keep this in mind and be more awakened regarding continue this. The con yeah. Continue the discussion. It should yeah. not only be in Akureyri, I think it should be. Yeah, all, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but because I, I think it's easy just to, yeah, 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 and then just go ahead and do your thing. Yeah. So, so we should be you. aware of what we are doing in our practices. Yeah. Well, thank you, panelists, and thank you all, all of you who are taking part. Oh, and I, I will take uh, Auslaug. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Gudrun, and thank you. Very I keep much. looking for it, but I probably need, need a huge screen. Do you do you find yourselves going like, okay, just you know, I'm looking at Minnesota now, and now this is Harpa somewhere, and and. But thank you, Auslaug. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, I was just said thank are. you, panelists, and, and thank you very much, presenters, for the first half of the program for your contributions. I think this has been very enlightening, actually, this uh, this seminar or this webinar, as this is called it, and uh, and I think this has uh, given us a lot of new ways of thinking, certainly, and 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 good food for further thinking in the in the uh, in the uh, quality council and uh, where we actually have representatives from all of the universities in Iceland. So I think we will be able to move forward. And, uh, and I think uh, what this tells me really is that uh, there is no way back. I think this is the only way forward 
if he really means something about intercultural inclusiveness of our societies. And we certainly need that, I think, in this present day and age. So I think there is no way by this is just now. Now we have to march forward together in this in this direction. So thank you very much indeed. And, uh, and especially for our international speakers, very much appreciate having, having you with us and, and that you took the time to, to, uh, to be with us today. And, uh, and thank you very much, Peggy, for, for uh, contributing from the, the, uh, from the student side in these discussions, excellent. So thank you. So I think we'll call this a day. And, uh, and Sigurður, he'll, uh, he'll send out a link for the recording of the seminar. And you'll get access, of course, to all the presentations uh, from the speakers. And, uh, and uh, so I hope that more people will be able to enjoy this that couldn't actually be with us then today. So again, thank you very much. I think I'll then just close this meeting. <laughs>